أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وحبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وآل الطيبين القاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائه المجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي عمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أعظم الله جرنا وجركم بمصابنا بأبي عبد الله الحسين عليه الصلاة والسلام Now continuing from yesterday what we stated was and the theme that Mahdi sallallahu alayhi as opposed to just being that glorious father of humanity that will represent a very complete state that the humanity will have attained. He is also a living, present reality. He is a reality which is in the process of evolution and growth, in the process of culmination, but he is also a reality at present, a reality shared within humanity at large. And he is also individuals of humanity that from time to time come and push the human community forward in a positive direction. What we are trying to say here is, and we will take assistance of the hadith that we mentioned yesterday, is that as opposed to thinking of a futuristic Mahdi, we need to invite Mahdism to work positively within us at present. There is no question of an individual coming and heading a human community in which the human community itself has not ripened, has not matured. For every prophet that has come on the face of this earth, this is what we're going to explore today, the ground for their coming was ripened before they came. Otherwise, they would be ineffective. The prophets would not have come in the first instance had the ground not been prepared for their coming. And you see, it's quite easy to understand. And the world in which we live is not the world that we have understood. Our understanding of the world is so inaccurate that it is a laughable state or a lamentable state. For Moses to have arrived at the Nile and for Pharaoh to have been chasing him and the Israelites to be with Moses trapped between the unforgiving sea in front of them and the bloodthirsty sword subduing them from behind them was the meticulous planning of this earth. How amazing is what happened at the right time, the precision in the way things happened. The tectonic plates of the earth were set into motion from the time of the formation of the earth that predates Moses by billions of years. The tectonic plates were going to collide at a particular time, creating a tsunami effect. Moses had just taken birth 30 years ago. God has to fulfill his promise of delivering Moses and the Israelites, destroying the Pharaoh all at the same time. And for that, he put the earth at work billions of years ago. Moses has just taken birth 30 years ago. Pharaoh is chasing Moses at this moment. Allah has to make it all come together. Moses strikes his staff. The sea splits open. Moses crosses. Look at the precision and the meticulous way in which nature behaves and operates. It's a living world. A world that a mind of her own. All of us fit in so beautifully, so meticulously that if anyone were to open their eyes to the truth, they will exclaim, as Surah Baqarah states, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ 
رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا that the people who remember Allah standing, sitting on their sides, and they contemplate into the contents of the world and the heavens. And then at that moment, there is this great epiphany, realization, and they exclaim, O oh Lord, you have not created any of it in vain. There is a purpose to it all. What we are trying to say is, instead of having futuristic notion of an individual coming and delivering us to actually have a realistic appreciation of what is happening. The Mahdism that we talk about is a present living reality. What we stated yesterday was that there is no such thing as past. There is no such thing as future. There is nothing but the absolute present. And in that present we have to live. In that present we have to operate. But it's a great shame that through very inaccurate appreciation of life and an appreciation, an inaccurate understanding of the future of human life, we have taken away the charm of life from life itself to the extent that this opportunity that has presented me a singular opportunity right now, this is my opportunity, my God. This is for me to make or to break. I have no more than this limited slot on the face of this earth. I have awoken. What a great shame that I fail to ask those fundamental questions. What is it all about? What a great shame that I am led in this life through notions that I have not even examined. What a great shame that I am not critical of life when it is my belonging. I have full propriety, ownership and stakeholding of this life that I should give it away to notions that I have not critiqued, which have rendered my life void nullified my life and made it wholly useless. Why should I not stand and say, what is it all about? Why should I not stand and say, this does not make any sense to me. It is sheer nonsense, if I were to use that word, without offending anybody. Why should a Hindu not question himself and say, the worship of these idols that has preoccupied me with so many rituals, I went to India, and the amount of rituals that these poor Hindus have is suffocating. Their lives are spent in, spent in rituals, in superstitious beliefs. None of them are awakening to the truth. What a great shame that a Christian should not ask fundamental questions that how can anybody else save you when salvation comes from the core of your own being? If I am not a person who is liberated from within, then who can liberate me? A thousand Christ may, may taste the bitterness of the crucifix. What will it do for me? What will it do for me? I am after all my slave. What a shame that a Jew does not awaken to the truth and understands that you cannot be a chosen person until you yourself are liberated from within. What a shame that a Muslim does not critique his religion and is laid and is led by these notions of exclusivist exclusivism that salvation is yours only. How can salvation be yours for the sake of designation of Islam? How? How does that make sense at all? That just because I have the label of Islam, I am on the path of salvation. How can a seed without wanting to sprout become a tree? Is it possible? That the seed says, I'm an apple tree, I'm a, I'm a seed of an apple tree, that I've attained the status of an apple tree without undergoing the arduous journey of having its chest torn apart so that a tree may emerge from it? How can Arif sit here and say, I'm a believer of Mahdi, I'm a believer of the Prophet, I'm a believer of Al Hussein, and exclusively salvation is mine before his chest is torn apart? in search of the truth. How what a shame that a singular opportunity that is mine is escaping me. And I don't avail myself of what God has given me. Imagine. 
on that day man shall exclaim when he finally recalls and says if only I had presented forth something for my life and Allah says to what avail is your awakening on this day of day of Qiyam? what a great change in this world of God and in our world there is nothing but goodness by Allah it's a beautiful it's a world worthy of acknowledgement. This life is a beautiful life. It is a life worth living. Why tarnish the experience through this negativity, which is wholly inconsistent with the condition with which God has fashioned us? Now, yesterday we stated that this Mahdism that we are anticipating in the future, it's nothing but the present right now. If Mahdism works right now, then it will work in the future. If it doesn't work right now, it won't work in the future. But what is it at present? It is that beautiful want of humanity to arrive at its completion at the present right now. If this is not paid heed to, there is no sense of another Mahdi coming until and unless humanity is able to bring about goodness in its own self. At present, there is no future to look forward to because we are the authors of tomorrow in our today. Now we quoted this hadith yesterday that Allah has authored both intellect and ignorance. Intellect was adorned by beautiful human qualities. Ignorance was adorned similarly by all the qualities frowned upon by humanity. All the lack is within ignorance. All the positives are within intellect. Think about this carefully. What I'm saying because we need to build into this topic. Night in our mind is the absence of day, isn't it? Darkness is the absence of light. Ignorance is the absence of knowledge. The absence is seen as a lack. And that is seen as the quality of ignorance in this hadith. And the affirmation and the affirmative attributes which are actually most befitting for humanity are seen attributes which are worthy. Both these states are in us equally. At this present time, Mahdism in operation is that we allow the positives of the intellect to manifest themselves. Ari first and foremost before waiting for the coming of a Mahdi who will provide him salvation has to allow his own Mahdi to provide him salvation. His ignorance is most akin to a state of arrogance. Believe me, when we analyze ignorance it is nothing but arrogance. Otherwise Abu Jahl, the father of ignorance, was known as the father of wisdom but his inability to appreciate the truth that the prophet brought gave him a status of the father of ignorance not that he was ignorant it was because he was arrogant ignorance here means arrogance and regression from within if we look at humanity believe me human beings are good people they are the lights of Allah SWT. it is only a very few within the folds of humanity that lead the majority to a despicable end because the majority despite being good do not want to awaken or take the stakeholding of their lives and responsibility of their lives. Mahdi's in operation at this present moment is for Arif to allow his own goodness to prevail within his own individual self and within his community and within humanity at large because we all share the same destiny. This is what we stated yesterday that the point of activity and proactiveness that Mahdism creates it creates it not in passivity of waiting for a savior but in activity to produce that savior from within and to create a conducive situation where humanity is arriving at a point of salvation. <coughs> Look at the example of the Prophet of Islam. He created such a beautiful situation. People who were falling head first in the pits of hell, 
He brought them to a level by liberating them and allowing them their evolutionary processes to take place with ease brought them to a pedestal of existence where Allah says, Kuntum khayru ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best community ever produced within mankind. Imagine the sort of belief he had in mankind. And he leaves this community of his, how? A very pluralistic community. Look at the first constitution of Medina. It allows for the coexistence of Jews, Christians, and you know who? The pagans who did not believe in the Abrahamic faiths. He allows their peaceful coexistence. If this is not pluralism, then what is pluralism? Bound together by common values and common interests and common spirituality. And then he allows in his constitution tribal laws to resolve their tribal problems. If this is not liberalism, then what is liberalism? He allows the Christians and the Jews and the Sabians to coexist with the Muslim community in the fold of greater Islam. And he calls that his ummah. And he is the author of that ummah. And Ali after him is the second father of that ummah. Imagine his broad sense of reality and truth in human life. That was Mahdism in practice. For him, today's Muslim, I don't know where the mind of the Muslim has gone. When the Muslim says the Ummah, he means Muslims. When Muhammad wasallam said Ummah, it means his community that he had created with its Muslims and with its Christians, with its Jews and with its pagans. He bound them all in one Ummah and he called them his Ummah. Look at how restrictive the Muslim mind has become. Mahdism in the present is that broadness of human mind. It's that proactivity of the human mind and the human soul in creating that beautiful atmosphere in which good curtails our ignorant and arrogant tendencies. But today, what we witness within the Muslim Ummah is the trait of the Dajjal. This regressiveness. As I said yesterday, the Dajjal is not a state of ignorance. It's a state of high sophistication. High intellect. But high intellect used not in the favor of the progression of good, but for selfish means. For coercion. For Carving out one's own domain at the expense of the good of the others. That is what Dajjal truly is. The very fact that the Muslim today can say that only salvation belongs only to the Muslim shows he is on a regressive trend. The very fact that the Muslim cannot find a binding force between the different sects shows that Muslim has got nothing to do with Prophet or Mahdism. He is actually on a regressive trend. The very fact that the Muslims can condemn each other to the pits of hell, the very fact that the Muslims are not tolerant of each other, forget about tolerance, it's a shame we talk about tolerance, honestly. It's a shame we talk about tolerance. Tolerance is the lowest expectation of humanity. What we should be talking about is appreciation of the other. Not about acceptance and tolerance. Acceptance of the other is a pedestal higher than tolerance. Appreciation of the other is divinity and godliness. The way God appreciates the Christians and the Jews in the Quran. Look at the beautiful verses that are there in Baqarah, in Al Imran, and in Surah Al Nisa. Read just these three surahs, and we will find Allah full of appreciation of the people of the book again and again talking about them. You see, Mahdism at present is what the Prophet had established. If you see when the Jews were saying, Lan nar illa ayyaman ma'aduda, they used to claim that the fire will not touch us except for a few days. And then they used to claim that the hereafter is khalisatan lana, is specifically for us. Allah would rebuttal and rebuke them and say, well, look, 
provide your evidence for your claims that you're making. And as opposed to that, Allah would say in the Quran, yes, the one who commits a crime and is surrounded by his mistakes, hell awaits him. And as opposed to that, he who does good, then in that case they shall have a good requital and paradise awaits them. He gives general rules there and does not separate a faith from another. And look at that most beautiful, such a universal verse, echoing with human ethos, in which when the Prophet at the conquest of Mecca comes into Mecca peacefully, and this is the most universal declaration befitting the state of humanity, in which he says, Ya Yuhal Insan, Inna Khalaqnaakum, Ya Yuhal Nas, Inna Khalaqnaakum, In Bakarin Wa Unsa. O people, we have created you from man and woman, made you into tribes and nations. By interaction, you may know that the best among you is the one who is most God conscious. He does not say, Ayyuhal Muslimoon, or all people of the book, or you who have brought faith. He says, all people to the most human community at large. Do you not see this broad mindedness of the truth and of the Quran? And this is the Prophet working in his community. And this was the Ummah of the Prophet and the Ummah of Ali ibn Abi Talib. This, if we can understand, is Mahdism in working at present. Now that is one facet of Mahdism that we spoke of yesterday. What is the other facet? When we look at existence, and this is something we need to discover so that we get our minds accurate and our world views accurate. If we look at the world of God, I'm not saying that the Big Bang model is an accurate one. Nonetheless, it resonates with what we observe. If you look at this world of God, what do we see? We see in this world of God and we need to discover certain truths of humanity through it. And we need to discover the truth of Mahdism because the Prophet falls in the fold of Mahdism. All the Prophets, all the Imams, because it's a human truth. Mahdism means promotion of good, culmination of good. How is it? If we look at the world of God, we find it on a unidirectional path. Look at any part of this earth, you will find there is no stagnation. Nothing is at a standstill. There is no pausing. There is motion. Show me something that is stagnant. Imam Sadiq said, this wood that you consider to be stagnant, by God it is in motion. Did he say that? My God, what a brain Imam Sadiq was, by the way. We want to discuss him at some point. Just a little glimpse of this man. Everything is in motion. However, the motion in the creation of God, it is not a lateral motion. It is a vertical type of a motion more so than a horizontal motion. What do we mean by a vertical motion? By a vertical motion, what we mean is it's an evolutionary motion. Everything is going from a state of weakness into a state of strength. Everything is elaborating and coming to the fullness of its own self. Everything, in other words, is realizing itself. It's a state of self-realization. Now, if we take the Big Bang model, from those humble quantum particles to this, it was all there inside those humble quantum particles which were being spewed by another black hole somewhere. And this is what has come about. Is it strange for you to understand this? If so, then look at a little seed. That little seed planted in the heart of the earth, provided with proper physical conditions and observe its journey, unidirectional journey. There is no stopping. It will tear itself apart, sprout and become a little plant, bring about a trunk, then branches, then leaves, then fruits, and procreate itself, and it goes on and on and on, and every seed has the potential of becoming the same tree. It's a unidirectional journey. If it is still strange for you, then think of a conceived ovum. As soon as it is conceived, it begins its unidirectional journey. One, from weakness into strength, self-realizing itself 
from a fetus into a baby, from a child within a lap to one that crawls, to one that walks, to one that runs, to one that emotionally feels, to one that reasons, to one who becomes spiritual, to one that becomes angelic. There is a unidirectional motion enjoyed by everything on the face of this earth. Show me one thing that defies this. Why should human social, intellectual and spiritual existence be other than an evolutionary existence? Why should it be? Look at human beings. How we have evolved in our intellect just like a child crawling to a young man taking full control of their lives. From a point in which human beings fell in prostration to the mighty waves to a time where they have subdued these waves from a time where the human being used to submit in prostration to the great sun because they saw the connection of their lives to the rising sun to the time where a human being casts his intellectual reign upon the sun and analyzed it and laughingly talks about and talks about its beginning and its end. Look at this intellectual evolution. Similarly, the moral evolution. At one point, we were led by religion and religious biases. I remember a time where we used to ask fatwas that is it permissible for us to feed a hungry stomach that is not the stomach of a Muslim? Today it's unthinkable that anybody would ask such a fatwa. Today our ripened state of morality is such that if a person is hungry, it is their God-given right on me that I should feed them regardless of their religion. Isn't it? Think about this carefully. Religion is not needed. Fatwa is not needed. This is the true religion. From a time when fatwas used to come and tell us that you can steal from the non-Muslim to a time where human morality is such that we know stealing is an evil, no matter where it may be, whether for a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Isn't this moral evolution? Every single thing is evolving. The modes of communities are evolving. Human intellect is evolving just as human physical being is evolving, just as the world is evolving. It is realizing itself. In there is a precious gem that we need to discover in order to understand what we are talking about in terms of Mahdism at present. Now, let us work at this example once again and explain the fullness of what we're trying to say. Mullah Sadra actually talks about this in terms of miracles. And I want to talk about it slightly different, but we will take aid of his discussion. He says, at the time of Nabi Nuh, the human intellect was still involved in physical entities, in nature, involved with nature, hadn't become abstracted. So the miracle of Nabi Nu was what? The great floods. It is a wholly physical miracle. At the time of Musa, however, the human intellect had evolved. The human mind was able to exploit nature, create illusions and illusionary. The miracle of Moses was what? A staff. It is a physical miracle, yet with an intellectual twist to it. It becomes a serpent. It's not a purely physical miracle. It is physical together with a tint, a hint, a slant of psychology. At the time of Isa, the human mind has ripened a bit more. Where people are practicing medicine, they are exploiting nature, understanding its potency and using it to their own benefit. What was the miracle of Jesus? It was in accordance with the intellectual aptitudes of his people. His miracle was curing the lepers, giving sight to the blind, resurrecting the dead. It is still physically connected, yet it is highly intellectual, yet physically connected. In the time of Muhammad Rasulullah the human intellect had evolved to a level that it was able to understand 
abstract understandings. And what was the miracle of Muhammad Rasulullah, the Quran? It is nothing to do with physical being. It is a wholly intellectual miracle. It is words and meanings. It is wholly intellectual miracle. This is the evolution that has taken place in the intellectual being of human community. And the miracles have reflected this evolution. As I said, I want to take it a little bit differently. Look at the time of Ibrahim. If you look at the time of Adam, the religion of Adam was a very simplistic religion. The principles were the same. The principles of righteousness and liberation and growth. However, the law system was a very simplistic system. Do not kill. Basically, do not kill. His context was a domestic context. You come to the time of Nabi Ibrahim. Human beings have become nations. The principle is the same. The principle of liberation, self-realization. However, we are talking about complexity of interactions. So the Sharia of Ibrahim is a far more fine-tuned and sophisticated Sharia. You come to the time of Musa. Ibrahim's Sharia is modified and abrogated to a great extent. The principle is the same. The principle of growth and liberation. Moses' Sharia accommodates that level of growth. Isa's Sharia is a further refinement upon Moses' Sharia. And when the Prophet comes, it's the final Sharia. It's the final Sharia at a fine level of evolution. It replaces Moses' Sharia, Isa Sharia, Ibrahim Sharia, yet the principle is the same. The principle of evolution and the principle of liberation. We are seeing the evolutionary track involved at every level of human existence. How odd that the Muslim mind has stagnated at the time of the Prophet. Is it possible that we have evolution from the time of Adam till the time of the Prophet and after that there is no further growth in evolution? Is it possible? Is this understandable? No wonder we have stagnated. No wonder we are regressive because the very facet of existence which is growth, liberation and evolution has not been taken into consideration by the Muslims at all. Every single thing was moving on. Now you might say this is an audacious statement that you're making. I will say if you find me audacious, then look at this super giant Imam Sadiq Look at this superhuman by Allah. Had I not the reverence in my heart for Muhammad Rasulullah Ali ibn Abi Talib, and had I not studied their example that fills me with awe to the core, I would have said, by God, this world from its beginning till the end has not produced the like of Imam Sadiq. This is how phenomenal this man is. Study him and look at what he was doing. He reinterpreted the text of the Prophet in his global context. Do you know this? Again and again, Imam Sadiq has reformed the law system. The way he gave us theology, spirituality, and the law, you can see evolution taking place. I'll just quote a hadith or two maybe to explain this as we go into this. Somebody went to Imam Sadiq at Hajj and he said, can we take the meat out of Mina? The Imam looked at him and he said, yes. He said, although in the time of my grandparents, the Prophet and Imam Ali, they used to insist that that meat should not be taken out. But because now there are so many pilgrims and who judge, there is no scarcity of food. Take it out of Mina. What a phenomenal statement. Our ulama, they resort to what we call conventional reconciliation of the hadith, which is wholly defeatist. Because they say that the prophets and the Imam Ali's hadiths are authentic hadiths and they cannot be wrong. So Imam Sadiq has to be interpreted in the light of the Prophet and Imam Ali. Whereas I'm saying, no, the Prophet and Imam Ali need to be interpreted and reinterpreted in the light of Imam Sadiq because Imam Sadiq came at a far more evolved level. The level of the Prophet and Imam Ali 
was a parochial level considering the level of Imam Sadiq which was a Muslim empire in a global level. See the Prophet and Imam Ali were addressing their immediate situation. The Imam looked at the ethos, the principle of liberation and revolution and re-evaluated the same ethos in his context which was far more evolved. Why drag Imam Sadiq from his position back to the time of the Prophet whereas everything is moving on? We never say that we need to interpret the Prophet of Islam in the light of Moses' Sharia, do we? We say no, that the Prophet's Sharia and Prophet of Islam is far more advanced. Why do we then want to drag Imam Sadiq from his era which is a far more evolved era back into a previous era whereas the previous era's instructions need to be reinterpreted in the modern era it doesn't make sense nobody will make sense of this and that is the reason for this regression for this stagnated mind for this wishful thinking that is wholly inaccurate if anybody knew the sharia of the prophet it was Imam Sadiq nobody else knew it better than him or the Imams that came after. Look at the way in which Imam Ali explained what Khums is. Look at the way in which Imam Bakir modified the whole law of Khums. Look at the way he was modifying the law of Khums again and again. Because he said there is a physical property in that. It needs to cater for your needs right now. And I will change every portion as I feel fit. And he used to also explain why he is changing it. Evolution is an undeniable truth. It cannot stop. Now, I'm going to now talk about a hadith and how our thinking is accurate. The Prophet said, Inni tarik fikum as I am leaving with you two weighty things. Kitab Allah wa atrati. The book of Allah and my progeny. Yes? Now, in other verses, in other forms, the Prophet also said, The weightier of the two is the book of Allah. And the less weighty is my progeny. The Shias get offended. They said, of course the Imam is weightier than the book. Of course, there's no doubt. Imam is the living Quran. The Quran is a silent Quran, yes? Nobody can doubt it. But it's their failure in understanding what the Prophet is saying. It's a totally messed up mind. The Prophet was saying that the Imams, when they give you instructions, they are looking at your context. The Quran is relatively free of a context. So whenever the Imam is changing the same law, he is doing it in the line of the ethos of the Quran, which are universal, and he is applying those ethos to your immediate situation, which can change all the time. And hence, the Itra is a lesser weight, and the Quran is the heavier weight. Because the Quran is always that point of reference again and again. If we can understand the prophetic narrations properly, then we will see evolution is the absolute norm. If we understand this, then we ask ourselves, what does Mahdiism mean? We go back to the hadith, we go back to the discussion of Mullah Sadra. Mullah Sadra states, at the end of his discussions on miracle, that when the 12th Imam comes and he quotes the hadith, he will not come to make you pray Salah. He will not come to make you fast. He will not come to make you perform the pilgrimage. He will not come to make you pay Zakat and Khums. You will have matured enough by that time to be doing all these things. So what will he do? The Hadith states, he will stretch out his blessed hand. Place it upon your heads and drive your intellects to their completion. That will be the supreme miracle of al Bahdi, That he will bring about the beauty of humanity within you yourselves. And that is the attainment of goal. Human being arriving at the fullness of their human potential. Tell me, somebody says to me, Miracles, I will say, what can be a greater miracle than humanity arriving at its own completion? Resurrecting the dead is a child's play. It's a joke. 
Breaking the moon in two is a laughable thing. Tearing the seas apart is nothing. Human being arriving at the completion of the human journey is the utmost attainment. When did the prophets ever use miracles to sharpen the minds? <laughs> miracles were only those little tricks that they used to call people to the intellectual content of their message. Wasn't it? The prophet split the moon in two so that the people would pay heed to the content of the Quran, which is highly intellectual. Moses threw the staff and made it into a serpent. What were the Israelites supposed to do? Look at the staff and kiss it? No. They are supposed to listen to the intellectual content of what Moses has. So that would lead them aright. The staff was nothing. The staff was just a means to coerce the people. The splitting of the moon was just a means to ignite curiosity in them so that they may come to the real message. The real thing is, none of these miracles, the real thing is humanity coming to its own completion. And that is the whole message of Matthew. The truest, I often say this, that if somebody were to come here and resurrect a dead for me, and says, now believe in me that I'm the prophet, I will say, why? By resurrecting dead, you are increasing the burden on human society. Let them die. Let them rest in peace. We've got 7 billion people on the face of this earth. We can't rid ourselves of poverty, and you're creating a few more. Let them die. It's a blessing for us and for them. And then just because you resurrect a dead, if you were to resurrect a 100 million dead people from their graves, I will still not believe in you until you give me the intellectual content of your message. And if that appeals to me, then I will believe in you. But tell me, have you got a social system which is just and fair that you can teach me? Can you talk of politics that allows for the growth of human community? Can you teach me an economical system that is fair, balanced, principled, which can feed every empty stomach. If you can give me that message, then I will believe in you as the prophet. But by you resurrecting these silly little graves and deaths, doesn't mean anything to me. Split the moon in two or split it in ten parts, doesn't mean anything to me. What does splitting of the moon do for me anyway? What does resurrecting the dead do for me anyway? It's the content of your message that appeals to the completion of humanity that has the appeal and that's the hallmark of your truth. Now, look at the great failure of the Muslim. As I said, I will be critical, but because I'm being critical to me and myself, yes, it is my house, it is my religion, it is my prophet, they are my imams. My heart is burning that the message of my beautiful prophet and my imams, these glorious creatures, has been totally misunderstood by the likes of me. And through the likes of me, hundreds and thousands of minds are vegetating because I am doing this great disservice. Look at the failure of the Muslim mind. Through our wishful thinking and wholly unrealistic understanding, of Mahdism and the eventual end. Look at the disservice we have ended up doing. The community has no confidence. Today, I will ask the Muslim, you who are saying that you are so great and you are the chosen one, tell me, what have you done for the world? Show me a contribution that you've made. The only thing you do, O oh Muslim, is you react to whatever good the world brings out. That's what your role is. We had this Muslim parliament in the UK formed in the 80s. They were a bunch of reactionaries, although the founder was a very noble man, Allah bless him, but I'm talking about the mindset. Anything that came from the West was to be looked upon suspiciously. But here was our prophet, and here were our imams, who appreciated the learnings of the world and built upon them, didn't they? The transmission of Greek philosophy into Islam was encouraged by our Imams. When the Prophet was asked about Plato 
in about Aristotle. The prophet said, they were prophets of God, learn from them. He encouraged it. When the prophet went to Medina, he said to the multi-faith community, I believe in everything revealed unto me and everything revealed unto you. This goodness is to be shared. But the Muslim, look at the Muslim's mindset. We are the other. Everything you bring about is wrong. There is something wrong about it. Who can deny that international democracy, international democracy is something good? Who can deny this? Only the Muslim can deny it. The Muslim will say it's evil. Why? Because it doesn't come with the label of Islam. I will say to the Muslim, in our Quran, find me a chapter that says Surah to Iqtisad, the chapter of economics, or Surah to Siyasa, or Surah to Ijtimaiyat, a chapter of sociology, a chapter of economics. Where are these chapters? It isn't there. The whole point of it not being there is that the human being was supposed to evolve and to understand the notion of fair economy, the notion of just society, the notion of <coughs> governance of state. The Muslim was supposed to contribute meaningfully, in which the Muslim is reciprocally benefiting from the rest of humanity, sharing in the good of humanity, because this Mahdism is spread within the hearts of humanity, in its plurality. But look at the state of the Muslim. Now, any Muslim who writes a book and labels it as economy, the Muslim says, this is our economy. When <coughs> Shaheed Bakr al-Sadr, rahmahullah, a'alallah maqamahu, when he read, when he wrote the book, Our Economy, yes? Or Our Philosophy, or Our Sociology, these were his thoughts about Muslim economy. They might be totally inaccurate. This was his interpretation. It was meant to be critiqued and for others to follow it through. But look at the wishful thinking of the Muslim. This is our economy as opposed to Western economy. This is how blinkered the Muslim is. This is our sociology. This is our politics. It's not so. It's not so. It's inaccurate. When somebody just labels it our economy, it doesn't mean it's Muslim economy. It's Islamic economy. It means uh, these are the thoughts of an individual. And it is as Islamic as it works. And if it doesn't work, it's not Islamic anymore. It needs to be re replaced by something else which is far more advanced than it in the evolutionary track. So what does Mahdism mean at present considering this facet of evolution that is taking place at all points within nature and within humanity? What Mahdism means is that there are no two points in human existence that are the same. The intellect has to evolve at every point and we should not hesitate in accepting this beautiful growth process. Once we arrive on the trend of evolution and growth, tomorrow we're going to talk about change and how to understand change, yes? Then we are on the path of Mahdiism. No wonder that Muslims will say first and foremost, that Mahdi, your Islam is wrong. This is not the true Islam. Because he will be so advanced in the way he is that the Muslim feeble minds, the regressed minds, will not be able to accept him. This is in accordance with the Hadith. That when Mahdi comes, they will say, this is not Islam of your grandfather. Two, and I want to point at this, this might hurt a little, but as we go towards Masai, this whole business of kafir and Muslim, what is this? Kafir, kafir, kafir. People say we need to take out this particular sentence from Ziyara of the Sahih Muslim. Muqatul kafirin abisayfik. I'm saying, no, it's true. This actually is the most true statement. He will kill the kafir with his sword. The problem is, who is the kafir? Who is the kafir? And as I said, it's going to hurt a little. According to Hadith, when Mahdi comes, I've already quoted this when Mahdi comes, the ulama of Qum, a great many of them, will oppose Mahdi. They will wage a war against him. He will put them to death to the extent that the river flowing behind Masuma's haram, Salamullah will be turned red 
through the flow of their blood, who is the kafir and who is the Muslim. It is all up for grabs. All of these things need to be defined, redefined, and to be understood in the, in the human light and human context. Mahdism is not what we have understood it to be. It is a glorious human reality. I want to take on the discussion of evolution tomorrow and change. But look at these fine evolved souls in the camp of Al-Hussein. The souls who have allowed the truth to prevail upon themselves. There is a person who enjoys intimacy with Hussein. Now the reason for this is that this particular soul is endowed with such love for Hussein that his name is Habib. We find this incident from the life of Habib ibn Mawair that the Prophet was watching Al Hussein in his childhood playing with a group of children. When he was playing, the Prophet observed very carefully. And he said, bring that child to me. When the child was brought to the Prophet, the Prophet began to kiss that child. The Sahaba <laughs> baffled and said, Ya Rasulullah, he has other friends as well. Why do you kiss him? He said, you did not observe what I saw. He was following my Hussein at all points. And you did not see the loving gazes that he was giving to Al-Hussein that I saw in his eyes. He is a true lover of my Hussein. This was Habib ibn Mubayr. We read from the Maqatil that as the enemies were gathering in the, on the plains of Karbala, Zainab comes to Al Hussein and says, Oh Hussein, do you not have anybody that you can invite to come and assist you? Hussein stated, Oh Zainab, in this barren land, in this jungle, who may Hussein call for for his assistance? Zainab said, Oh Hussein, your childhood friend, your intimate companion, Habib ibn Mawair. Hussein writes a letter and dispatches it to Habib. We find this description that it is night and there is a knock on the door of Habib. Habib sits to dine with his wife. He calls out, Who is it? And a response comes, I, the messenger of Hussein. Habib rushes to the door, opens it, takes hold of the letter, presses it against his chest, and then kisses it. He opens the letter and reads the content from Hussein ibn Ali to a worthy man, an alim, a faqih, a reciter of the Quran. O oh, Habib, I am trapped within Karbala. Hasten to me. Least I am put to death before you arrive. Habib's wife asks, It was the messenger of Hussein. What brings him to us at this hour? And what is the content of Hussein's letter? He says, O maid of God, Hussein is under the threat of death. What does he ask for, O Habib? He asks me to join him. Then, O oh, Habib, what have you decided? I fear for you after me. She said, O oh, Habib, do you have no fear for the daughters of Fatima who are with Hussein? Are you preoccupied with concern of your own wife? He said, O oh, maid of God, I merely stated this to test your faith and your resolve. Habib, make haste to join Hussein. Habib gives his steed to his slave and says, wait for me at the borders of Kufa. I shall join you. Habib goes out into Kufa. Hani meets with Habib. Habib says, asks Habib, what has become of Hussein? He says, Hussein is trapped within Kufa. He said, what is it that you intend to do? 
Hussein is trapped in Karbala. I wish to join Hussein. He had henna that he had purchased. He broke the jar. He said, by God, I will have my white beard colored and covered by the redness of my blood in the love of my Hussein, and I too shall come with you. We hear this, that the servant of Habib was waiting with Habib's steed at the borders of Kufa, saying to the steed, O oh steed, fear not. If your master does not come through fear of death, I shall ascend you and set forth for the assistance of our master, Hussein. When Habib heard this, he said to his slave, I free you in the way of Allah. Take your freedom and save your life. He said, O oh Habib, if you have freed me, then allow me to join you and assist al Hussein. They set off from Kufa. It is said that Hussein had prepared standards and had distributed standards, but had kept one standard with him. His companions were desirous that he should give them the standard. Hussein said, no, the carer and the bearer of the standard is on his way. And no soon has Hussein said that, that at a distance they saw raised dust from the hooves of the horse. And Hussein, in anticipation, said, This is the bearer of the standard. When Habib appeared close to Hussein and saw the face of Hussein, he said, Oh, Hussein, even though I have become old, even though my bones have become brittle, even though my skin has withered away, but one glance at you fills my veins with just with such youthful blood that I wish to give my all to you once again. There was a commotion within the camp of Hussein. Zainab inquired of Fizda, what commotion is this that we hear? Fizda ran and she saw that Habib had come to join Hussein and there was a sense of joy within the camp of Hussein. She came back to Zainab and she said, Hussein's childhood friend has come to assist Hussein. Zainab said, Fizza, await not. Convey my salam to Habib. When Fizza conveys Habib, Zainab's salam, we hear this from the Zakirin. Habib took his two hands and slapped his face. And he said, Ah, for destitution, what times have befallen the household of Muhammad that his daughters made salam to their servants? Habib, mobilizes support for Hussein from the clan of Bani Asad. When the day of Ashura dawns and the combat begins, there is mutual combat. And when the soldiers of Hussein fall one by one, there are only a very few left. Hussein's Muazzin reminds him that it is time for prayer. When he reminds him, Hussein begins his prayer. Habib says to Imam Hussein, O oh Hussein, allow me to engage with your enemy and pray this prayer before, after, behind your grandfather. Hussein allows him. Habib enters into the battlefield. Hussein watches Habib. Habib recites war poetry. O oh people, evil are you who have invited a guest to you and have prevented him from water and instead are tearing him into pieces with your swords. By God, had we been equal in numbers, we would have taught you and given you to taste the sharpness of our blades. Habib fights with his enemies. He kills numerous number of enemies, over 80, until Habib is struck with an iron maze upon the back of his head. When Habib is struck, he begins to descend upon the plains of Karbala, and calls out, Wa Husayna adrikli. Hamid ibn Muslim states that when Hussein hears the plea of Habib, hopelessness befalls his face, and he cries out aloud, This is the first time I hear the cries of Hussein filling the air. Hussein arrives at the body of Habib with Abbas, carries Habib's head. And says, oh Habib, shall you leave me? Shall an intimate friend bid his friend goodbye so abruptly? Oh Habib, 
Who do I have after you? Habib breaks into a smile. He says, oh Hussein, this is your grandfather. He quenches my thirst with the goblets of Kothar and says, oh Hussein, al-ajal, al-ajal. Oh Hussein, await not. Come to me, I await you eagerly. I will say, oh Habib, take the glad tidings that your soul departs this earth in the lap of Al Hussein, come with me on the Asar of Ashura. Look at how Hussein trembles upon the dust of Karbala. Shimar has placed his knee upon the chest of Hussein, and a blunt dagger arrives upon his neck. There is no lap to carry the head of Al Hussein, as Hussein's head is cut from his body while he is still alive. على لعنة الله للقوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أيهم قلبين قلبون ما تنعصي